Hi everyone, welcome to Communicast, a communication skills podcast. I'm Scott D'Amico, president of Communispawn, a global communication skills training company. On each episode, I try to distill down what it means to be a great communicator. In today's episode, I'm talking with Raj Ramachandran of Hydric Consulting. In this episode, we chat about our ABCs. And no, Raj and I are not singing the alphabet song. It's Raj's take on the classic Always Be Closing from Glen Gary, Glen Ross, which for him is Always Be Curious, which will lead to effective listening and questioning. Beyond that, Raj shares a number of fascinating analogies and experiences from his career spanning some of the most well-known academic and business institutions in this country. I hope you enjoy. Raj, thank you so much for joining me today. You know, if we can, just to get us started, maybe tell those out there listening a little bit about your background, yourself, your experience. Absolutely, Scott. Thanks for, for having me. Um, I'm, my name's Raj Ramachandran. I'm based in Houston, Texas, and uh, I've spent the majority of my career in the leadership and workforce transformation business. I started my career off at Accenture and IBM, and then after getting my doctorate in leadership I, uh, from UPenn, I've been working in the executive search space here for the last uh, seven years um, with Hydric. So that's that's how I got into the the, the work that I do. As far as what I specialize in, Scott, um, I I like you know trying to keep things simple. So um, you know, kind of have this A B C D idea where I, I do assessment work, I do board and top team alignment, um, I do culture transformation work, and then I do diversity and leadership development. So that's the the simple uh, A B C D, if you will. Excellent. Now, thank you for sharing that. And I would have to imagine in your line of work with the experience that you have, you come across probably a, a lot of folks that are really good, really strong communicators, and then maybe some, some folks not so much that, that could use some help. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, when you hear the term, say, you know, communication skills or that somebody is an effective communicator, what comes to mind when you hear that? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I, I guess you know, there's two things that stand out. To me, in terms of what I've come to observe from working, you know, across the hundreds of Fortune 500 companies and you know, lots of leaders in these organizations, um, I think the best leaders are actively listening. They're seeking to understand, and two, they're highly effective at asking the right questions to drive insights. It's more the whys and the what ifs versus the, the pure hows and what's. Right. So I think that that is just what I've noticed as to be a the effective you know communication skills, if you will. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. And I've seen that throughout my career as well. And it typically seems you know, one leads to the other, right? The ability to effectively listen is going to lead to understanding of what's going on in their world and, and asking thoughtful, relevant questions. That's right. And for me, listening is a skill. It's something that takes a lot of effort, a lot of practice. You know, from your experience, how is that you know, a skill that either you've developed or you've worked with people or seen people develop that, that true listening skill? Um, it, it, it's like anything else, Scott. I think I think it's something that you can develop, but you have to put focused attention on it. I think we have this notion that we all, you know, we all know how to listen because we've got two ears, so we listen. And I don't think that's the case. I think for me personally, I use a a four to one ratio, which means for you know every hour that I have to be presenting or, or with a client, I will spend up to four hours preparing for that meeting. Um, and again, it depends how much I know or how much I need to get ready, but really kind of allowing me to get ready for that meeting. And then when I'm in it, I don't have to prepare anymore, right? Because I'm, I'm in the session, so I can be, be here now. It's an expression that we use. I can be in the moment, but I think just having that preparation and spending that energy so that you can be actually listening and realize that it takes work. Look, when you're actually listening after a good active listening session, you should feel tired. Do you Absolutely. actually do feel, because it is a bit exhausting because you're putting all that energy into listening. Um, and then you know you're actually listening because you put energy against it. You, you bring up a great point about preparation. You know, this idea of a four to one ratio for everyone, it might be a little bit different as to what they do to prepare to go into a meeting or a big client event or discussion. But the idea that you know, if you're prepared, I think you said, it really enables you to be in the moment and to listen. You know, and I think from, from my experience with listening, it's one of those skills you have to really prepare yourself for and set the right environment. You know, for this, 
Outlook is shut down. My phone is completely turned off. Teams has been, you know, do not disturb. My family has been notified as to what's going on. So no knocking at the door. So that I know that I can really lock in and just pay attention to what's going on here. Now, with this idea of preparation, do you think you can over-prepare? Oh, wow. Um, I mean, I, I could argue yes, but no. What I mean by that is, I forget who said this, but work expands the space you allow it, right? So if you give yourself an hour, you'll take an hour. If you give yourself 20 minutes, you give yourself 20 minutes. I think we get really good at, um, I think more the problem for people is under-preparing than over-preparing. I, I, I mean, I think of any, you know, the heroes in sports that you may have if, um, you know, I'm a football fan, so, you know, watching someone like Tom Brady, I don't think he ever says, oh, I'm over-prepared for that game, right? right. Um, <laughs> I, think, I think it's usually I haven't done enough. So yeah. I, I don't know, I haven't come across exactly so I, I plan too much for it. It's just being really clear that I need to devote time to it. And one more point I'll, I'll bring up, I mean, I, as you were talking about your preparation, one thing I realized is while I try to shut everything down and be focused, before the meeting, um, I'll actually give myself five minutes to actually breathe. Literally take five minutes and not actually have anything in front of me. So even before coming into this one, I gave myself the five minutes to actually not be on email, not on, on anything else, but literally to be get myself zoned in you know, for, the, for the meeting. And even if it's as simple as five minutes, Right. I think that's another key element that we don't talk a lot about, but I, I think it's important when you get into these types of sessions. Yeah, absolutely. And especially if you think about, you know, you had mentioned right as we jumped on before we started recording, this idea of back to back to back to back meetings is allowing yourself time. I need to stop. I need to just breathe a little bit, decompress and you know, get my mind right for what I'm going into next. And you, know, as you're preparing and getting prepared, for me, the idea of you know, over prepare or not is you still need to be flexible, right? You, you mentioned athletes, Tom Brady or something like that. They're so well prepared that when they get to that line of scrimmage, you know, they can quickly scan, call the audible, make the change. So it's, you know, having just that, that comfort level to not get locked into what you've prepared because you may get into that meeting or the discussion, it goes a completely different direction. So are you able to be able to, to pivot quickly based on the prep work that you've done? You know, I, I love that because I'll give you an example. So when I was at Accenture uh, years ago, I was, <clears throat> I was with this partner. I was in a partner at that time. And I was working really closely with this individual. And we were preparing for a really big presentation for a, a client pitch. And we must have, I mean, we have this PowerPoint deck right, that we're working on. We must have had 50 iterations back and forth, back and forth. And I was getting exhausted just trying to work on this, right? You know, back and forth, back and forth. And, we, you know, day of, we're in the meeting. And she actually says, you know, to me, don't, before we joined or before we started, she goes, don't use the deck. And I was like, wait a second, I just spent all this energy preparing for this material. I have the material. She goes, no, you should have it so well that you don't need the deck anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay, you don't need that. You and, and she was right. That we didn't need the deck. We could actually have the conversation. Um, so the point of that preparation is when you're there, you no longer need the, you know, the crutches of, of the deck. And, and, and she, she, would, she actually says something, she goes, the best deck is the one that you don't have to use. And I, that one just, that, that, that stuck. Obviously that stuck. Right. Yeah. You, we see, we see this a lot in, in the work that we do is people get so caught up just in the slides or the visual that if, if there's a technology problem, it glitches, the slide goes down, they're lost. They were just so locked into what's there. You mentioned the idea to be able to just simply have the conversation, right? You know, right. The, the slides, the deck, that's a tool to ultimately lead the conversation so you hit on this idea of preparation and then really listening leads into effective questioning. Yes. You know, from, from my perspective, you know, the questioning, being able to ask relevant questions is so important for any type of, of discussion, right? To really get to the root of what's going on. You know, if you think about questioning from your perspective, whether it is you know, at home or at work, you know, how do you approach that to be able to make sure that you're asking you know, the right questions, so to speak? Oh, that's a good one. I, I, look, the... The thing about questioning, um, this is actually something I think you and I probably encountered when we were, you know, um, working together before. This idea of, um, you know, preparation and having a question set, I think getting ready for a meeting is to be really curious mm -hmm. and to know that, um, you know, you're getting ready for a conversation and you're lining up your questions that are pretty inquisitive, right? So, so the way I almost do it is I, there's a, uh, 
a skill as opposed to brainstorming. I think it's called question storming. So if you're mm -hmm. getting ready for a session, you literally just spend five minutes asking questions um, prior to. So I, I would actually prepare by giving myself that time, five, 10 minutes, whatever, just asking questions are coming to mind. And usually the first set of questions are bogus. It's in that second or third you know, tier that becomes real because your first set is like, you know, your, your brain comes up with stuff. Why am I here? What's important to you? What keeps you up at night? I mean, you hear these kind of things. Mm -hmm. When you get to that second and third layer, you get into some really interesting questions. So I, I practice that question storming skill on myself. And then when I'm working with clients, I use that as a way to get to the real core set of, of questions that matter. No, that, that's great. I think that's a good, good practice to have, right? It's going in before meeting, just going through all the potential questions and then really leads back to preparedness, right? As you're in the meeting, you're going to feel the, the flow of the discussion, understand which of these questions are really going to get to the, the root of the problem that the client may be having or really whoever that you're talking to. The great thing about communication skills is that they're so transferable, whether you're talking with your kids or your spouse, your partner, somebody at work, you, a contractor that you may be working with, being able to effectively communicate just cuts across all aspects of life. Absolutely. And, you know, I think if you go through your preparation, you are really listening, you're asking those insightful, thoughtful, relevant questions. To me, that's what's going to inspire people to action, right? This kind of thing that you hear about people being inspiring leaders or telling, you know, ins mm -hmm. inspirational stories Oftentimes people think of it as, you know, the football coach, you know, giving that big halftime speech, you, know, you and I both big Buckeye fans, maybe Ryan Day trying to rally the troops at halftime, which kind of need to do lately. Um, yeah. But, you know, this idea of, you know, the inspiration, getting people moved to action isn't always just standing on the chair, shaking your fist, being loud. It's the mm -hmm. culmination of all these things that go into communication skills. Yeah, you know, um, I, I think this is kind of embedded in, in there as a maybe as a question, but this idea of like what are the skills that what are the effective communication skills that, that are needed today? Mm -hmm. And I, and I think I was just you know sharing with you this um, you know I've been traveling all week and I was at a I was leading an executive workshop earlier this week with a client um, and this question came up like what you know what do we need to do to to uh, to have better soft skills? And I I paused him right there and I said. I would say one reframe, don't call it soft skills because that actually sounds soft and weak. Mm -hmm. These are actually core skills or anchor skills that you can use to augment your technical skills. So that flip to say, okay, we need to reframe what we would call this category because there's no some communication skills or soft skill training. And I'm like, no, these are core skills. And then I would, I, I asked them to kind of bucket them into three categories. I said, what are those execution related, you know, skill sets. So your ability to deliver and then communicate what your, you know, what your results are. That's kind of, you know, thing one. The second is, you know, around relationships. So how do you collaborate with your peers, having that authenticness and, and empathy. And that third is that vision or that inspiring call to action with that, you know, clear point of view. So even that, I would just kind of frame it up in using, you know, some way to, you have to process these skill sets, right? So that's the mechanism that I use in my clients. Interesting. So now, would you say, have you seen any change in, mm -hmm. in those skills that are necessary over the past 18 months as the world and the world of work has really shifted? Yeah, I mean, absolutely, because we're doing more of these, you know, Zoom sessions and, and virtual, right? So the, the ability to be really impactful requires empathy more than ever. Um, that Because the, the downside is it's very easy to go from Zoom to Zoom and switch. And then you lose the ability to, to really be empathetic because you've just jumped from call to call and you're like, it all looks the same, mm -hmm. right? It's like, like when you get emails, the, the, the disadvantage of, of the emails is that anyone can get you an email, right? Anyone can send you an email and it's really hard to know, wait, is this one more or less? So the same thing happens in these Zoom situations. So you have to really be empathetic and you got to work on that even more to be here now versus even in a, you know, in a classroom environment or in a face-to-face -face meeting, I think. Yeah, and I think I, I heard something recently from Microsoft CEO talking about empathy and caring being the new currency, that it's so important, especially in the, the environment in which we are today. And as you mentioned, with whether you're bouncing to back-to-back -back Zoom meetings or you're simply now just on the phone with no really no interaction, being able to see those visual cues, or with email, where there's virtually nothing that you can gain from what that person, their perspective, their point of view, what they're going through at the time, 
just the idea of you know, taking a little bit of the time and try to understand their point of view, where they're coming from, which for me is one of the foundational components of empathy, the idea to be able to understand somebody else's point of view. And, and I, I definitely agree with where we were, you know, 18 months, two years ago to now, this idea of caring, empathy, understanding, so important, just because not everyone is in the same situation that you or I may be in. You know, if you think of, you know, people working at home with a lot more distractions, a lot more going on, having to care for other people. There's just all these other things that we need to be aware of when we are communicating with folks, just to make sure that we're creating that, that culture of collaboration and trying to work towards the ultimate goals at, at business. Yeah, I mean, it's funny you brought up Microsoft because um, yeah, I'd done some work with them a couple of years ago and obviously they, they prefer using Teams versus Zoom because I mm -hmm. guess they have a product in this space. But um, the funny thing about, about working with them is that uh, you know when Satya Nadella, their CEO, talked about this kind of leading with compassion and empathy? Initially, there was a bit of like skepticism because they're a very technical, you know, performance-driven organization. And again, that felt like a soft skill. And he, um, he, I guess the organization worked really closely with Carol Dweck, um, who who um, worked on a book called Growth Mindset, and that became the the DNA fabric of of Microsoft's kind of transformation, right, in, in what they're doing today. And one thing that Carol Duck says about growth mindset is that you have to realize that um, use the expression you're not there yet. Right? And she emphasized the word yet yeah, because it's, it's a progression. So even Microsoft today is as, as great and as, um, you know, as, as transformative as, as it's been in the last couple of years, Sethi would keep iterating, we haven't completed the journey yet, right? So this, this compassion journey, this empathy journey, you know, all this stuff is, is a work in process and they're very quick to emphasize. He said, yeah, something like move, move from being a know-it-all company to a learn-it-all company, right? And, and constantly be learning because that's how we're going to get better. Now, I, I love that the idea of a, of a learn-it-all rather than a know-it-all. I might need, need to use that with my 12-year-old. Uh, my, my <laughs> it seems right now I think he knows everything, but <laughs> you know, so well, shift, yeah, shifting gears a little bit to what maybe you've seen in the workplace or seen with working with some of your clients, yeah. you know, we've known each other for, for quite some time. And one of the things I've always really just admired about you is your, your, your curiosity, right? You're always mm -hmm. wanting to know and to understand things. You know, so if you think about your career and you know, some of the things you've touched on, as I look at your, your background, it's a, it's a who's who of companies that people would love to work for. But you know, is it curiosity or maybe other skills that you think of that have really attributed to, to the success that you've had? That's an interesting question. I, I mean, look, I, I think it goes back to the, the, the Steve Jobs quote when I think he did this commencement address. You can only connect the dots backwards and reverse. But you can't, you know, if you ask me 20 years ago, could I have you know, predicted any of this? And the short answer is no. But I, I think what I've come to realize is um, it's a progression. And I start off with like early in your career, it's all about, you know, execution and results, right? That's like you, you're having to, get things done, right? And the ones that are disciplined and organized, persistent, hardworking, those skills are really key when you're early in your career. When you get to more mid-level, I realize the relationship skills become even more important, right? So how approachable am I? How, you know, sympathetic or, or compassionate am I, right? And then as I got to kind of, you know, later in career, and I, I still think I'm somewhere in between, you know, middle to late, but I think this idea of vision and curiosity, creativeness, um, that became even more important because you, you have to you have to realize you don't have all the answers and you have to tie back into relationships that you have. Um, you have to understand what's going on, ask those questions, and then look to others to drive results. I mean, it's not saying that we don't get stuff done ourselves, but you have to to um, you know multiply and and leverage others around you so that you can get a goal accomplished. So I would say. I call it conviction, compassion, and curiosity, right? In terms of those three steps. Got it. Yeah, and I think there's there's a lot of people that haven't made that connection yet of really working from the you know the conviction into compassion. This idea that they're still focused so much on on the execution component that they you know don't realize the importance of of relationship building, leveraging those folks around you to not only help you achieve your goals but to help them achieve their own goals and I just expand the influence that's going on. So that's interesting way to, to think about it. I love the, the three phases of the three tiers of the career progression. Now is there another another metaphor I use with that Scott is um you know I I, I kind of joke are you a 
you know, are you an execution leader or your relationship leader? Or are you a, 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 you know, a visionary leader, strategy leader? And everyone says they want to be strategic. I get it. But I, I think it's a combination of the three. Mm -hmm. And I almost kind of go back to the Microsoft metaphor. I, I say you're an Excel leader, a word leader, or a PowerPoint leader, right? Because it's like, you know, vision, word, and then Excel is execution numbers. And I think it's usually a combination of the three. Yeah. But you can almost say it as a progression in your career. Early in your career, it's all about execution. And, and you can think of spreadsheets and project plans, whatever. Then you realize how important language and, and relationships, um, communications are in that middle. And then as you get higher, it becomes even all about that strategy and vision because people are looking to you to set that direction and figure out where we need to go. So that, that's another way to can maybe stack those three. Oh, that's fascinating. I love it. Love it. So you have, have you had someone throughout your career where either they've, you know, one helped inspire your skills, your development, or somebody that you just really look to and it's just you always admired the way that they communicate and they've handled themselves in personal or professional settings? Well, um, yeah, you know, there's, there's someone that comes to mind. So years ago when I was at UPenn and I was doing my doctoral work, I had the good fortune of getting to know the chief talent officer at Comcast. Um, she was, in fact, on my dissertation committee, and we became good friends. But what I noticed that she did so well, Scott, was that she was very demanding in her expectations, but compassionate in how she led. Right. So there, there's something that she said that that stuck with me ever since you know, I've met her. Um, and she said, "Clarity is kindness." Um, so you know, and I think what she meant by that was, you know, you have to be good at being clear because um, it requires the empathy to be kind, you know, to her team and her leaders and her students like me. So she had that, she really focused on clarity so that she could drive that, that kindness, right? And I thought that was just a beautiful way to put it, clarity is kindness. Yeah, you know, I, it's a great way to put it because I think there's, you know, a lot of times people feel that in order to get results, to hold people accountable, that you have to be mean, you have to be nasty about it or be kind of a, you know, a hard head with it. But, and throughout my career, that's, where I've always been is that this idea of if I'm very clear with my communications, very clear with what I expect of people. And then from the back end, it's support is how do I help you get there? You know, it's that tends to be where, where the magic happens, where people really know what's expected of them, whether the expectations are very high or very challenging, but if they're aware of that and then you communicate it clearly and then back it up from a leadership standpoint with the actions of how can I support you? What do you need to help get from point A to point B? is I think how you mix the two of those very well. And I think a lot of people miss out on that. They feel that if I'm going to be a leader, if I'm going to bring results, I just have to really drill, drill, drill and be hard on people. And it's, I think, quite honestly, the opposite of it. Well, you know, kind of, Scott, it's such an interesting um, observation because I think what I found, this is the, you know, so I've got that biochem undergrad. I study like brain, I'm just very curious, right? So somehow I was like wondering why does the, you, you talk about the carrots and the sticks, right? So why is it these darn sticks are so effective? And the problem is this, it's, it comes back to our human nature. Like we're, you know, literally our DNA is whenever we see danger, what do we do? We, we, we run or we, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a fear, right? So okay. if you see a lion or a tiger, you're gonna, you're gonna run, right? But today we don't see lions and tigers, but we perceive threats. And that threat could come from a boss, could come from a peer, could come from, you know, the market, could come from the news. And it works because, um, you know, our bodies are meant to kind of protect, right? So what I've learned is you almost need to have like four positives to counteract that one negative because the negative is really powerful because, um, you know, that's how our wiring system works. It looks out for danger. So when you, you know, why, I think why the people are mean is the way it kind of shortcuts. It's like, hey, I need to get results now. So I'm going to tell you, Scott, get this done. Or I'm going to be on you. And you're like, oh yeah, I better listen. But what you have to realize is that, um, you know, you, you have to find ways to counteract that because it's almost like using jet fuel versus green fuel, right? So jet fuel is good. It'll, it'll get you there, but you're going to burn out. And that's what we're seeing so much right now in the market is that people are just burnt out because we've been using, we've consumed a lot of jet fuel in terms of get things done versus really using renewables and green fuel, which requires this four to one ratio of like positivity. <laughs> it, you, and, and I think the reason that we, also are still seeing this today, these types of leadership styles is that they bring results, but oftentimes it's short-term results, right? People yes. don't stick around with them too long. They'll, they'll drive them really hard for a year or two. They'll bring the results and then they're gone as soon as they get, then they get new people in there and they bring results. So from the macro level, it looks like, oh, this person's always bringing results, but they're constantly churning through people. 
And I would argue that the results likely would be greater with a, a more effective leader in there that's not constantly turning through people, having to retool the cost of talent acquisition, losing relationships, all that stuff, uh, by applying just the more more solid leadership principles that we've been talking about today. Well, you, you know, there was a, and actually I'll tell you one more quick story. There's a leader that you and I actually worked with uh, years ago, and um, I was really taken by this individual because they were very good at, at very cool, calm, operational excellence, execution, getting things done. And there was almost a fear, you know, that, that was going on the organization. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because when I had moved on, um, I was able to reach out back to this individual and kind of get to know him better. And what I learned was it actually came out of, um, out of fear himself, uh, mm -hmm. which was mind blowing to me because what ended up happening was he just, the way he was raised was all by fear. So he thought that's how you should lead. And inside he was actually very nervous and he was not. So what I was helping him kind of realize is that um, if you led with you know, that green fuel, you'd be even more effective. And I thought that was like, he was just not aware of that. He was, was taught that you know, if you lead with kind of the iron fist and right. you know, operations, execution, mindset, performance, that's how you're gonna be successful. And it was almost kind of a, a hidden you know, realization that wait, that, and he wasn't, unfortunately he wasn't even happy himself. Okay, so here he is leading that way, and he wasn't as yeah. effective, and he was feeling that, but he didn't know what else to do, and it was really fascinating to, hmm. to kind of give him another way, um, which is what I love, I love doing anyways, helping leaders kind of find these alternative paths to become better and where they're happier and more successful, and it helps the team that they're with. Yeah, no, I, I think I know who you're talking about, so it's, it is, I mean, it's fascinating when you really get to, to connect with people in, in a different type of environment and really learn where they're coming from. Some, sometimes it's misguided, sometimes people just, that's their belief of how things should be and they're gonna go at it that way really regardless. But yeah, I do believe if you kind of take that more thoughtful approach, lead with kindness and, and empathy and clear communication, you'll get much better results for it. Yep. So we're, we're about wrapping up, Raj. I wanna be respectful of your time. So you know, as we're closing out, any, Final thoughts, or you know, if you're there's some you know professional out there just starting out, they're really thinking about you know how can the communication skills impact my career. You know, what advice would you give for them? <laughs> um, well, it's kind of, there's a lot written on this topic, right? And available online. Um, all I can share is you know my my own experiences and, and examples. I was one of my clients was was J and J a few years back, and we were doing an early career program you know for their for like ten thousand of their frontline leaders, right? And it was really fascinating because the research that led up to that program, um, what I kept noticing was that what seemed to resonate was the ABCs, right? And I called it always be curious, compassionate, and act with conviction. <laughs> that resonated, right? And it was sounds simple enough, but as they were navigating their careers and trying to figure out what's next and how to like, you know, seek these things out, having that curiosity, having that compassion and acting with conviction, that was something that I think, you know, resonated with the groups. So I would just say, you know, remember your ABCs. Love it. Remember your ABCs you know, in, in sales. Typically that, that ABC was I'll always be closing. Be closing, but you know, I, I would say, right. Always be curious. will lead yep. to the closing of the deals. Cause you're going to find out a lot of tremendous information to really help you build the value of whatever it is uh, that you have as a solution. So Raj, thank you once again, so much for the time and for being with me today. I appreciate it, man. Have a great day. You're welcome. You too. Bye Scott. Bye Raj. Well, there you have it. Clarity is kindness. Empathy is important and always be curious. I hope you enjoyed my conversation today with Raj. Please stay tuned for more episodes and be sure to subscribe to Communicast. Thanks and have a great day.